So we spent the first half of this lecture looking at competition among species, which is a minus-minus interaction, negative for the fitness of both species. In the second half of lecture, we'll focus on the other three interactions, and we'll start off with mutualism, which is a plus-plus interaction, positive for the fitness of both species. So in mutualism, both species benefit from the interaction, and we can take a look at this as an example with the yucca moth and the yucca flower that it lives on. So the yucca moth will feed on the yucca flower and lay its eggs on it. And when it does so, it gets pollen on its body, and it moves the pollen from one yucca plant to another, thereby aiding the yucca plant in spreading its pollen, as in, and it serves as a pollinator. So the positive interaction, or the positive part of this for the moth, is that it has a place to lay its eggs and a food source in the nectar, and the positive for the yucca plant is that it gets its pollination done by the yucca moth. In mutualisms, we often call these a mutualistic symbiosis, where symbiosis means that two species are interacting in a close relationship. But mutualism is probably the better term for this because there are other types of symbiosis, and we don't want to get confused uh, when talking about symbiosis. With mutualism, there are two types. One is an obligate mutualism. In obligate mutualisms, the species cannot survive without the other. It is obliged to live with the one species. And then you have facultative mutualisms, where both species can survive alone, but they do better when they survive together, when they exist together. So an example of an obligate mutualism, <clears throat> at least for these ants, is the bullthorn acacia in Central America and these small ants that live on the acacia. So the ants live on the acacia. They make their homes in the hollow thorns of the acacia. They feed on nectar that they get at the base of the, of the leaves. And then they feed on these little yellow protein bodies that the plant produces for them to feed on. And the, mo sorry, the, the ants really cannot survive without the nectar or the homes or the protein. And so they're obliged, they're obligate mutualists with the, the acacia tree. Now the acacia tree gets a huge benefit from this in that the ants will clear away areas at the base. They will sting any sort of herbivore that lands on the plant. So if a caterpillar or a grasshopper lands on the acacia tree, they will sting it to the point where it either leaves or dies. And they will protect the plant. They'll also cut vines that try to grow up the plant. So they give great protection. But the acacia tree actually can survive without the ants. It's not part of an obligate mutualism. It's a facultative mutualism for the tree, but an obligate mutualism for the ants because it is the only place that the ants can survive. As we look at other interactions, we can look at commensalism, which is kind of a strange one. It's positive for one species and a zero for the other species. And these are kind of weird interactions. Very hard to document because it's hard to show that something truly has a zero effect on the other species. But we can see this with golden jackals and tigers in India, where the golden jackal will follow the tigers staying away from it because uh, the tiger is obviously a very dangerous predator. But when the tigers leave behind a kill, the golden jackals will come in and feed on the leftovers. And so it's positive for the golden jackals because they're getting some food. And it's a zero interaction for the tigers because they don't uh, directly interact with the jackals and the jackals have no impact on them. And then the fourth interaction, which is really a group of interactions, is called consumption, where one species consumes the other species. All right? We can break consumption into three types, predation, herbivory, and parasitism. Each of those probably makes some sense to you. Herbivory is the consumption of plants. Predation is the consumption of some sort of consumer, primary consumer, secondary consumer. And parasitism... <clears throat> is where one species doesn't actually fully consume the other species, but it takes resources from the other species, uh, typically by um, either living within the host species or 
uh, drawing blood or something from the host species. So herbivory is a really interesting one. So herbivory refers to an interaction in which an herbivore eats parts of a plant or an alga. So an herbivore, by definition, because it's eating a primary producer, it would be a primary consumer. And so we have herbivores, and shown here is a monarch caterpillar. Now herbivory is interesting in that it drives plants to develop defense mechanisms. So you see things like thorns on plants, and thorns on plants are designed to keep species from climbing up the tree. We also see that the milkweed on which the monarch butterfly caterpillar feeds actually has a sticky latex that is, has some toxins in it. And those toxins are toxic to most herbivores, um, but the, the monarch butterfly caterpillar can consume it. And they're what give the monarch butterfly its unpalatable taste that keeps it from being preyed upon by other species. So obviously the monarch butterfly evolved some adaptations after the, the milkweed evolved this uh, toxic latex and the monarch butterfly then has the ability to digest the milkweed without that toxic latex killing it. Predation then is an, uh, an interaction where one species kills the other and consumes it. So in predation, we see that it is a very strong selective force and it can lead to the prey species evolving. So for example, if this prey species could evolve to have white fur in wintertime, that would be a great adaptation for it. Um, <clears throat> And then when the prey species evolves, the predator species has to evolve to keep up. And we call this an evolutionary arms race. And we'll look at this a little bit later on with moths and bats, and bats being the predator on moths and how that has caused the change in uh, characteristics of both species as they evolved. With parasitism, we have an interaction that's a plus minus. In one organism, the parasite derives nourishment from the other, and that's positive for that species. And its host is harmed in the process, so it's negative for the host, a plus minus interaction. You can have parasites that live within the body of their host, like this roundworm that lives inside of human intestines, and that's called an endoparasite. And then you can have ectoparasites, those are ones that live on the surface uh, feed on the surface of the host, um, either stay attached permanently or very temporarily like a mosquito. So if we look at all of these, one of the things that all of these interactions lead to is coevolution. When one species affects the other's fitness, it will lead to the other species interact, uh, sorry, the other species evolving. And so we see this with all four types of these interactions. Now, if we look at these species interactions, what's going on is natural selection or survival of the fit, fittest. And there's kind of three possible outcomes when species interact. The first would be an ecological elimination. And that could be something like competitive exclusion, which we might be seeing with the warbler species we talked about. Or it could lead to, say, prey extinction, which has happened when the invasive brown snake arrived in, in the island of Guam and caused many species of native birds to go extinct. The other is the ecological change, where you have a change in the realized niches. So this is not an evolutionary change, it's a simple change in the ecological behavior of the species. And then the third is the evolutionary change, and this would result in natural selection driving the system. We're going to look at an example of bats and moths later on with this. Now, for natural selection to occur in a species interaction, we have to meet four conditions. So the first of these is that there has to be variation in the trait that natural selection is acting upon. The second is that that variation in the trait can be inherited. So typically that's genetic. Then more offspring are produced than can survive and reproduce. 
and you get differential survival and reproduction based on some version of the trait that gives higher fitness. So what this means is a lot of offspring are produced. Some of those survive and reproduce better because they have the particular trait of interest. And those without that trait of interest have lower fitness and tend to send on fewer copies of themselves to future generations. Those with the better trait will send on more copies of themselves to future generations. So that over time, we will see an increase in the trait that is more beneficial. Now, natural selection, again, favors versions of the trait with higher fitness, allowing that trait to increase in the population. These four conditions we will revisit later on in the semester because we'll talk a lot about evolution in the third part of the semester. So please uh, pay attention to these four conditions and you should start to learn them and memorize them at this point in time. Now coevolution is when species are reciprocally affecting each other's evolution through an ecological interaction. And this can happen in all types of interactions. Here we see an example where it happened in a mutualism. And Darwin observed this flower pictured at the left. It's an orchid. And he observed this on his travels in the early 1820s. And he thought, there has to be some sort of pollinator that can access that. And that long spike at the bottom of it must have a pollinator that has a some way of getting to that nectar. Now he never observed the sphinx moth that does this, but he predicted that there would be a sphinx moth and then later scientists did discover this sphinx moth with this incredibly long tongue that is long enough to reach down to the tip of the tube and get more, um, get the, the nectar. And by the orchid evolving this longer tube, it made it more likely that the sphinx moth would get close enough to actually grab to, for the pollen to attach to it so that it could pollinate that orchid when it visited the next orchid. And that long tongue that evolved on the, the sphinx moth obviously makes it easier for it to access that nectar, whereas if it had a shorter tongue, it might only be able to get a small amount of the nectar or no nectar at all. Now we're going to look at an example of bats and um, moths. And we know that bats feed on insects at night, or at least most bats in North America feed on insects at night. And they do so by using sonar. So they send out an ultrasonic sound that then bounces off of the organism that they're trying to feed on and allows the bat to hear, but actually here in a way that gives them a map of the what they're seeing. So it's almost like visual hearing, for lack of a better term. And they can detect where that moth is and then go feed on that moth in complete darkness. Now, <clears throat> bats evolved flight because moths had initially evolved flight. And this is because this is considered a, an evolutionary arms race. So it started off with moths gaining the ability to fly. Later on, a mammal developed wings that probably allowed it at first to just glide from one location to another, eventually allowed it to do locomotive flight. And what we see is first the moth developed the ability to fly, which necessitated the bat developing the ability to fly. The, the bats then develop sonar to be able to find the moths in the dark, but then the moths evolved ears that allow them to hear the sonar clicks and then developed a process called sonar jamming. And that would allow them to interfere with the bat's ability to detect where they are by jamming that sonar with similar sounding clicks. So then the bats evolved sonar clicks that were below or above the hearing range of the moths. So then the moths could no longer hear them. And the moths then evolved sonar absorbing wing scales. 
so that they would reflect back less sound. That led to bats evolving lower frequency sonar. That led to the evasive flight maneuvers in moths. And that led to better flight agility in bats. And you can see how this escalated from just one species being able to fly and then the other one flying to be able to eat it and developing sonar. But then that sonar uh, started to get jammed and so on. This is an evolutionary arms race. And we see this with a lot of different ecological interactions. Now we want to talk about something called mimicry. So if we want to think about mimicry, this occurs in a lot of different interactions. Um, but there are two main types of mimicry. The first is called Batesian mimicry, where a harmless species mimics a harmful species. And the second is called Mullerian mimicry, where a poisonous, uh, venomous, or harmful species, uh, many of them resemble each other. And so we see that type of interaction when we think about different bees having a black and yellow pattern. That's Mullerian mimicry. When we see organisms that mimic a bee with that black and yellow pattern but themselves are harmless, that's Batesian mimicry. Batesian being where a harmless species mimics a harmful species. An example of Batesian mimicry is the Congolese giant toad, a harmless species that mimics the gaboon viper, a very venomous snake. And this, this mimicry occurs because the toad develops similar coloration to the head of the, the gaboon viper. It makes hissing noises like the gaboon viper, and it lays flat when it's alarmed, so it looks like the head of the gaboon viper. By doing so, predators are a little bit confused at first and don't attack the Congolese giant toad, allowing the Congolese giant toad to have higher fitness, avoiding predation. This is a commensalism, a plus zero interaction, where the Gaboon Viper is not impacted, so it's a zero, and the Congolese giant toad is a plus. Then we can look at Mullerian mimicry, and these are multiple species in the genus Heliconius, and they're bad-tasting butterflies and so they all taste bad to birds, and by having similar coloration, it serves as a similar warning coloration to get the birds to not feed on them. So these species benefit each other by having the similar coloration, and so this is a mutualism. Now I was curious about this, whether how easy it was to observe this in nature, and so I went out in my garden and started to look at um, the, the species that I could find there. I have a, a native pollinator garden. And I found one species of wasp. This is a yellow jacket. And another species of wasp. And you see the black and yellow pattern in both of those. And this is an indicator. It quickly made me realize these are harmful species and I didn't want to touch them. And similarly, even the bumblebee that looks a little bit different um, was a species that I recognized pretty quickly as uh, having that black and yellow pattern and being dangerous. But it also could be that, that we have the other type of mimicry, the Mullerian mimicry, where harmless insects mimic bees. So what I've just shown you here, where three harmful species mimic each other, is Mullerian mimicry. And the Batesian mimicry would be a harmless species mimicking mimicking a bee, and I was curious as to whether I'd be able to see this in my garden. So I looked at this, I saw this wasp species again, and then I found this beetle. And this beetle has that strong black and yellow pattern. Enough so that when I first saw it, I was thought, oh, I shouldn't get close to that organism because that's dangerous, even though I then realized that this was just a harmless beetle that was feeding on the same flowers. But by having that black and yellow coloration, it gets a benefit. That benefit for it is of no cost to the wasp. So it's a plus zero interaction. The Mullerian mimicry that we saw in the three uh, bee and wasp species is um, a plus plus mutualism because each species benefits from the other being present and 
sending off that signal because then it reinforces that signal in predators and makes predators more likely to avoid things with a black and yellow pattern.